Hi, I want to introduce Scott Barber. He is the founder of Perf Test Plus, as well as the co-founders of Whopper, the workshop on performance reliability. So we would like to welcome him at Google and give us a talk on uh, testing. Thank you, Sheldon. And uh, you know, I want to thank Google for letting us be here. They've been a fantastic sponsor uh, this week, uh, host for the Whopper Conference, uh, workshop on performance and reliability. Uh, over the course of the week, we had nearing 50 people coming in to talk about uh, more or less advancements in the state of the art of performance testing and uh, whether or not any of those advancements in the state of the art are actually making it down to the state of the practice. Uh, always a fun conversation. But uh, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, visual application usage modeling. Um, and that might sound super technical, but uh, for the most part, it's not so much going to be super technical. What we're going to do is talk through some things. And I actually subtitled this, uh, this presentation, Why Use Calculus When All You Need Is Crayons? Um, so sometimes, the point here is that sometimes uh, us geeks, and I use that term endearingly, uh, I'm very proud to be a geek, by the way, uh, get caught up. Uh, so far in the details that we miss some of the simple things. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. A little bit of background. So when we're modeling the usage of an application, uh, particularly uh, when you're talking about multi-user applications, um, we really see in practice two different categories of methods, right? A very rigorous method mathematically intense, uh, they tend to take a lot of time, require empirical data, um, can be extremely accurate. Uh, however, uh, when used out in the field, especially for websites, when you're on a, uh, a whole development release cycle that sometimes is short as weeks or days, hours, <laughs> um, you just don't have time to do that. And oh, by the way, the people who are doing it, um, don't have four semesters of calculus to be able to do all the analysis. And oh, by the way, it's a brand new application, and we actually have no earthly idea how anybody's going to use it. So instead, what we end up doing all too often is what I classify as overly simplistic. It's very quick, little or no math. Um, it's occasionally accurate. And I stress occasionally accurate generally by accident, and uh, basically pretty much ignores any empirical data you have, because what good's empirical data if you're not going to do any math with it? So what we've noticed uh, out in the field is that there's very little in between these two methods to, to help people in a fast-moving environment, in a non-academic environment, to get some degree of accuracy, confidence in our usage models that we're then going to use, of course, for testing, for development, to figure out, uh, for example, what areas of an application uh, are most critical, right? The, somebody comes up with a brilliant idea on a bar napkin. That's where most bar napkins are in the shower, right? That's where most good ideas come. And uh, we start developing it. But uh, we don't really know how people are going to use it. Every application people build, it seems, to do everything. Uh, but when it comes time, you know, to release, and we don't have time to build everything, what do we leave out? If we don't know how people are going to use it, uh, it's pretty much a shot in the dark. So like I said, in practice, uh, the empirical data is uncommon unless you're building a second generation of an application. Um, the complex math skills are rare. Um, and even the people who have them uh, went into software, be it developers or testers or administrators, managers, probably because they didn't uh, want to become mathematicians or statisticians. Um, we often don't have the luxury of time, and on and on. One of the biggest problems we found, and I'll, and I'll demonstrate this, is as you talk about application usage, you know, it starts with an idea, and then somebody decides if they can market it. So the marketers have an idea of what it's going to look like. And then they hand it to an architect who has an idea of what it's going to look like. And then our business analysts interview our users on how they're going to use it. And our testers draw 
you know, use case specifications and our developers draw state transition models and our architects draw network diagrams. And, but you can't ha hand a UML state transition model to an end user, to my mom. And my mom knows that I pick on her a little bit. She's not a, uh, she sees computers as more of a necessary evil that's been very nice to her son than much of anything else. But um, they're not gonna understand that. And when you ask a user what they do, and they give you, uh, you know, kind of their thoughts, and then you hand that to a developer, they say, how does that relate to anything? You know, how does that map to my classes or my objects? So that communication across the team is part of uh, what's challenging. Now, there are a lot of folks who have done some amazing, amazing research on modeling applications. Uh, Dr. Connie Smith, I don't know if anybody's heard, anybody heard of Connie Smith? Yes. Um, I am convinced she can model absolutely anything down to the clock cycle. It's unbelievable. Uh, however, it's not particularly easy uh, and it's speculative. It makes assumptions. If you don't actually build out the application to match the model, the models are meaningless. So even Connie Smith will tell you, you have to validate the model with real usage and real testing of some sort to make sure that you really did put it on a dual processor machine instead of a single processor machine or other things that could completely mess up your models. Uh, I'm standing at Google. I, I would hope that at least some of you have heard of Alberto Savoia. Um, most of my talks, people uh, haven't. Um, Alberto, obviously, was an executive at Google. Before that, he uh, was CTO of Keynote and Vologic. And back in 2000, 2001, he published a series of articles and thoughts that have become really the foundation for today's performance testers. Uh, he was ahead of his time. There were no tools to implement uh, his ideas. We finally have some tools. But uh, Savoya says, basically, uh, get empirical data. If it's never been in the field, do a beta rollout. Get empirical data. Well, if you're Alberto Savoya, you can tell your clients or your boss, does he have a boss, to do that. If you're anybody else, uh, that's harder than it may seem. Daniel Manask is a professor at George Mason and uh, very mathematical uh, modeling, mostly for capacity planning. Again, fantastically accurate. Um, I've managed to read his books. Uh, even after four semesters of calculus, uh, I don't understand all of his algorithms, um, which makes their field application very challenging. J.D. Meyer works for Microsoft. He wrote a book, Improving .NET Application Performance and Scalability. Um, it is probably the best blend of these things, but he still relies on empirical data and betas, and he doesn't use pictures. So all of these methods um, require empirical data. Two of them require advanced mathematics and statistics, and none of them are intuitive to a business analyst or, or a non-technical stakeholder or a user. So none of these are models that we can go and show to the whole team to gather input and communicate. So with the rigorous models, I, I fall back on a quote from my father, uh, who was an industrial arts teacher, became a middle school guidance counselor. That only happens in New Jersey, folks. Says, what sense does it make to measure with a laser, mark with chalk, and cut with an ax? So how accurately do we have to apply models when we don't know how the users are going to use it anyway? The models might be perfect, but they might be modeling something completely unrealistic compared to how users are going to actually apply our systems. So basically, the background summary is this. The rigorous approaches are beautiful, but often impractical. Um, how much value are these models if we can't communicate with them? If the only person who can use them is the person who made the model, uh, we lose the value of communication across our team. And why spend the time to make a complex model if nobody's going to use it? So what do experts say about modeling? Most people have heard this quote before. 
Uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. A model is a picture. It's a simplification to help people understand, conceptualize, and communicate about something. So George Box, who's not a software guy, uh, he's an industrial, uh, we call him an industrial statistician, uh, he's a systems guy. Um, and as he built models of systems like auto plants and whatnot, this is, this is what he realized, that many of the models were so incredibly complex, they didn't actually simplify the system, but they made it more complex and harder to understand. So if your model's not useful, don't bother. Ed Tufte. Oh, yes, sir. I was just uh, reading in the uh, blurb about uh, Dr. Fox, and was there any particular kind of variance that he was trying to exist there? In, in much of his work, um, the models that he's doing, you know, they're very factory, right? So it's... The, the one that I'm most familiar with is one that he did at an auto manufacturer plant. And the variance he's talking about is more human variance, right? So the machines move the parts, you have the parts, all those things, but humans do things. Humans tend to do things on uh, normal distribution curves, right? Uh, statistically, right? But as you start trying to figure out how much time, right, does the, does the uh, car frame need to sit in front of the person to make the weld, right? You need to figure out, you know, whether it's using some chi-square best of fit method or observation order, you need to figure out how long to sit there so that you get the weld, uh, but you're not holding everybody up, right? So it's those kinds of variances that he focused uh, on mathematically. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is anybody familiar with Ed Tufte? Fantastic. I love when people are familiar with him. Ed Tufte gives a presentation about graphical presentation of data that is probably uh, the single day that most influenced my entire career. Um, I walked in reluctantly, uh, I guess not reluctantly, arrogantly. What is this guy going to teach me about making graphs in Excel, right? Uh, but, you know, it's better than sitting in the office. That was my attitude. Uh, about 20 minutes in, I was on the edge of my seat. Uh, and it's all about the fact that we can process, we as human beings can process pictures and data points visually orders of magnitude faster than we can process words or tables of data or spreadsheets. So if you can put data in a format that people can just process with their eyes with a minimum of explanation, then we're going to be able to do math in our head that we could never do on pencil and paper. My son is almost seven years old. Almost seven years old. He's a fantastic little baseball player. Uh, I'm very proud of him. But when you think about hitting a baseball, I've read a statistic that uh, by random chance, if you swing a bat, if you know the ball is going to be a strike, if you're given the ball is going to be a strike, and you randomly swing the bat, it's a one in a billion chance that you can hit that baseball. My boy's seven years old. He hits the ball more times than he doesn't. Statistically, man, I want to take him out and buy a lottery ticket. Right? There's no way my son can do you know, parabolic math on a baseball. But my son can hit that ball. And it's because our brains can intuitively do that kind of math. And it's visual. It's all visual. So Tufty helps teach people, helps them think about presentation of data to make it intuitive so we can process it mentally. And of course, Savoya, who uh, I look up to greatly, uh, one of my favorite quotes of his that I use constantly, and of course we're talking about load, but it's still an application usage model, right? If it's not realistic, um, what kind of useful conclusions can you draw? And if you can't draw conclusions, you're wasting your time and your money. So we've got to find this balance, is what it boils down to, between these rigorous methods and the random chance um, that seems to be going on in the field. So basically what the experts are telling us about models are they need to be useful. A good picture, 
as opposed to a misleading picture is worth probably a whole lot more than a thousand words. But you know, that's the uh, cliche, right? And inaccurate models leads to wasted time and worse, poor decisions. And that's the number one thing as a performance tester specifically that I see regularly. We test based on some model. We get results based on some model. We make decisions based on some model. And then it goes into production. And the results from the model have no relationship to reality. So what did we spend all our time doing? So here, this is, uh, this is kind of a telling part for me. What kind of models are we used to seeing, especially when talking about multi-user applications, right? And web, of course, is the paradigm of that. There, there's a typical log file. There's all your usage data. But you know what? If I sit this in front of almost anybody that you, that, that's not used to reading log files or who's not a developer, you know, if I put this in front of a non-technical stakeholder, a business analyst, my mom, this is not useful. And I'm not sure it's technically a model, it's really a list. But, you know, if we apply parsing and sorting and math to it, we can get a model from it. It might look something, anybody seen that before? Oh, come on, you guys work here. Actually, I love Google Analytics, it's fantastic. For me, I know a little something about, about the web. I know a little something about how people move on my website. Uh, but once again, if I showed this to an analyst, the first thing I saw, and I know it's a little small, but it's a fantastic uh, piece of data, and this is just a snapshot I took the other night. Um, the top, in the top 10 clicks from my home page and to my home page are exactly the same. What does that mean? Does that mean that everybody who goes to my home page then clicks on my home page? Um, so it's good data, and I, and I know I can dig in and I can get more data. I'm not knocking this. I really do. This is fantastic. Um, but on a single page, it's not intuitive. It doesn't tell a whole story. This is uh, on my first, the, the first time that I was the performance lead on a project. I came in, and I, the first question I asked is, what does this application do? And the test manager came in, and he says, well, you've got the use case specs. I said, yeah, 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 but what does it do? So he came down with four three-ring binders full of use case specs. He said, here, this is what it does. And since he wouldn't answer my question directly, I opened them all up. I ripped out the page with these pictures on them. And I started laying them out on the floor, trying to figure out a flow of what, uh, what the application did. 125 ripped out sheets of paper later, about all I could figure out was there was a home page and people logged in and they had some account information and then there was some other stuff. I didn't even know what the stuff was. There was a lot of it. I couldn't figure out a flow. It just was not uh, useful in putting the pieces together for me to have a picture of what happened. As it turned out, it was an e-learning site. It had courses. It kept statistics. You could log in, you could log out, you could save where you were in your course and go back, finish the course, take a little quiz at the end, and your managers could log, then log in and see which courses you've taken. Isn't it a little bit easier to say that than to go through, what was that, 12 inches of paper to not be able to figure it out? So stick figures and bubbles, good for some things. Um, I haven't found them extremely useful in figuring out uh, how people actually use an application. State transition models. I can look at this and read this. Right? This happens to be uh, an ATM, an automatic teller machine. But as I looked at this, I realized that there are, it tells how the application can be used. It doesn't talk about how it will be used. And I think that's one of the, the, the paradigm shifts uh, when we talk about application usage, uh, that some people need to, to shift from. Not how can it be used, but how will it be used. And then, of course, we get paragraphs like this 
from uh, some of our stakeholders. Um, you can read it. A uh, couple of substitutions to protect the uh, innocent or guilty, as the case may be. But um, you know what? I can read that four or five times. I still can't draw a picture or make a prototype or really know what people are going to do. And then, whoop. and then this is an excerpt from uh, one of Manask's papers. Um, and I'm sure I've got some folks here that are mathematically far superior to me. But um, I start looking at that and start thinking about, my goodness, if this is what I've got to do on a client to build a model, I'm done. Because there's no way that I can communicate, you know, C0 over T to a non-technical stakeholder or an end user who's converting from a green screen to the web. Um, we've got to simplify some of these things. So what it boils down to is we've got a lot of models. We've got a lot of standards. We've got a lot of methods at our disposal. But they do not help cross-team communication. Um, we're not going to send uh, all our whole team to five different modeling courses so we can learn one another's models. We really need something intuitive. And I don't know if this ever happens in your groups, but I've seen it as a consultant, right? You get called in when there's a problem, so sometimes you forget that there's really good shops out there. But um, I've seen more arguments over whether or not a particular symbol is being used within the you know, 2.7 version of the standards, then I've seen talk about what in the world we're supposed to be modeling. We're supposed to help one another understand, not slaughter one another for reading a book that's a version behind. So maybe, maybe there's something a little better. It's a, white, it's a horrible picture, but it's real. Uh, this is a recreation of real, I admit. But in 2001, I was sitting in my office that was, I don't know, 40 feet long and 20 feet deep, wrapped with whiteboards. And I'd spent weeks and weeks working with a client, trying to figure out how the application is going to be used. We had a prototype. We could click through it together and we couldn't agree on how the application would be used. Uh, we kept debating and it was, it was intense. And finally, I got very frustrated and I walked up to the whiteboard and grabbed markers and I started drawing and I drew something very similar to this. Uh, probably not quite as neat because I wanted you guys to have some hope of uh, being able to read it. And he looked at it and he said, yeah, and he grabbed another marker and he started drawing. And my office buddy grabbed another marker, and he started drawing. Now, this thing went across like 12 feet of whiteboard. Um, and after a while, we got something that looked more like this. And so we've got activities. We've got, what do people do? Oh, they go to the home page. Some people log in. Some people register. After they register, uh, they're going to go and do some account maintenance. This was a financial planning uh, application. And Periodically throughout the process, they're going to run out of time or get bored or not have the information they need to finish, and they're going to save and exit. Uh, and uh, you know, some people are just going to go to the FAQ, and some of them are going to log in, and some of them aren't. Right? There was no standard to this. There was no there was no book behind it. There was no training. We used markers. We used whiteboards to talk to one another, and then we started adding these percentages. So what have we really done? Does anybody recognize this as something they've used before? It's a Markov chain. It's a Markov chain of frequencies and probabilities. But I promise you that if I'd have stood up in front of that man and said, let's make a Markov chain, this would not have helped our cause. So it's nothing new, but it's simple. This thing ended up picking up a name that was meant as a joke a long time ago, UCML, the User Community Modeling Language. There are nine basic symbols, uh, whatever. Um, 
I'm not here to sell you anything or sell you on my model, but the point is that five years ago, a whiteboard accident, literally, my frustration and my inability to communicate effectively with my client that led me up to the whiteboard to start drawing lines instead of verbalizing led to a thing that now people all over are writing me about and using and asking me to write books about. And, uh, frankly, I think writing a book about it would destroy the whole thing. But what they do is they draw these pictures, draw them by hand on paper, and they make photocopies of them and hand them to the whole team and say, what do you think? And everybody on the team from an end user to, to an executive VP to a marketing guy to a network technician takes notes on it and says, no, 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 that doesn't happen 80% of the time. That, were, that happens, you know, 43% of the time. And, oh, no, I know the president really wants everybody to go here, but nobody really does. That maybe happens 2% of the time. And, hey, what about that other activity that we programmed in last month? And they draw their lines and you collect them up. And over the course of 45 minutes, you have real data. And when you don't have empirical data to extract from, now you have a place to start. Now at least I know, oh, the marketing people think this activity is gonna be heavy. The users think they're gonna do this. The analysts think they're gonna do that. And maybe I can't decide what's right. Maybe I just use all three models. But now I'm down to three. And oh my goodness, if I do have some empirical data, now I can hold what people think is going on next to empirical data, and I can say, there's a discrepancy. I wonder why that is. Are we not selling our application correctly? Are we not modeling it correctly? Are we not logging it correctly? Or any number of other possibilities. But um, simple. And crayons is the kick here, right? Usually it's pens and markers. Uh, and as you can see, I, I've gotten in the habit now of instead of spending the two hours immediately after a meeting when I'm ready to go do something, uh, copying it into some format that's acceptable to whoever the client may be or whoever the stakeholder is, I just take a picture and I, and I do something like this with it later. Um, it's a little small to see, obviously, and um, I don't know exactly uh, how, if you guys can put slides with the videos or whatever, but they'll be available. Um, it's got color, it's got percentages. You can print it out, you can draw lines on it, you can X things out. Um, I sit this in front of people, models like this in front of people all the time for applications they're familiar with, with zero explanation, with zero training and they look at it for a few minutes, and they say, yeah, that makes sense, but what about this? And we've started the communication. And that, I think, is the key to the model. It's useful to a wide variety of people. People are reading the model, and I'm hesitating to just flip the slide. So, what's the point? When it comes to models, when it comes to modeling users, sometimes simple gets us further, faster than complex, rigorous models. Being able to use the same model across the entire team has value. It might not be the only model you use. It might not have all of the information you need. But if it enables communication, you know, sometimes I've seen developers take these activity models, user activity models, and start drawing little arrows with notes about what classes relate to those activities. I've seen business users write little arrows about which uh, division does that activity. I've never seen anybody do that with a state transition model. I've never seen anybody do that with a log file. Feedback loop is good. Um, like I said, sometimes I think that a lack of standards is more enabling than rigid standards. I'm not against standards. Sometimes standards are very important. But when we're doing something creative, when we're drawing pictures, when we're communicating, is it more important to communicate effectively or to 
achieve some standard that somebody we've never met says is the right way to do something. And whiteboards, obviously, Google understands. I have not been in a single room at Google without a whiteboard. Google understands whiteboards are easier to use for multi-user collaboration than an overhead projector. I think we should use that power. And of course, we could always use another excuse to use crayons. So I've given, I've given some links here, so that, and they're in a, uh, a horrible, I must have clicked them uh, a color, but they're there, um, to some of the people that I referenced. Um, and at the end is my contact information. And I'd like, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts or take your questions. If there are any. If there aren't any, I can go back three or four slides and start digging into the calculus and make sure to confuse you. <laughs> you guys have, uh, if you don't know him, you guys have a fantastic modeler who's known in the testing community around the world. Um, that's uh, Harry Robinson. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him this week talking about this. And, uh, you know, there's power. There's power in simple models that people understand intuitively. And uh, if there's one thing that uh, I can infect people with, it's uh, sometimes we need to put away the calculators and just use pictures. I think it's valuable. Pure you saw something similar in pure coverage? Yes, so mm -hmm. it does the call chains of the methods, and it, I think it has the percentages too, and then it also makes the lines thicker when you know, going down that particular uh, path more. You're, there are, are co pure coverage is one of them. There are code coverage tools that do something very similar, uh, maybe identical. And I wish, I wish that there was some tool that then mapped that something that a user would understand. Because a user doesn't understand classes and objects and methods. and So there's got to be some way to map it. I haven't seen a tool that does that. Extract that data from uh, when you do get a period right? That says sure. for every page you got to where the referring page was so that you can create all those links and track the user with a cookie or whatever so you can see exactly who you We are talking, and when I say we, um, there are several people talking to me about building a tool to automatically extract this information. There are people talking to me about uh, building a tool to use this for test design, to automatically do test design. Um, and I want there to be a tool. Uh, I want it to be easy. I don't want it to be complex. Nobody's written one yet. And um, I played around with it a little, decided that either I didn't have the time and energy or the... Uh, programming skill to do it the way that I envision it in my head. So sometimes, uh, you know, it's kind of like when, uh, as, a, as a programmer, right, you occasionally get promoted and become the project manager of the same thing that you use to code, right? That's a hard thing to do because you have this ownership of the code you wrote. Oh, you can't change my code. Change everybody else's code to fix it. Um, so I have a feeling that's part of my problem is uh, when I can't get the tool to do it quite right, I get very defensive with myself. It's a very bizarre internal argument. But um, uh, hey, I'll tell you what. This is all, you know, the, the nine symbols and the article and all the presentations I've ever done on this are um, uh, Creative Commons licenses. If somebody wants to build a tool, more power to them. Just reference, reference back to, you know, I'm the guy who, uh, through pictures on the whiteboard instead of yelling at his client. Um, love to have one. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about um, percentages and why keypicks are necessary, or are they necessary? Well, OK, so why are the percentages necessary? If all I'm doing is figuring out what an application can do, probably not necessary. If I'm trying to either evaluate risk, uh, importance, 
uh, if I'm trying to predict volume, frequency, uh, then it becomes very important. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm a performance tester. I'm all about uh, figuring out how people use the application kind of in 3D, if you can visualize it that way. Um, and if I have a model that says, oh, everybody's just going to go hit the FAQ and I can get 500,000 people doing that over the course of a minute, some stakeholder is going to take that information and say, oh, we can handle 500,000 concurrent users. We're done. But as soon as the first person goes to log in, uh, you know, maybe it takes a minute and a half now to get a page. So the distribution of activities uh, changes the performance profile dramatically. So uh, one, one of Harry's arguments actually was, well, just test a lot of them. And he's right. Except a performance test run to collect the data takes an hour or two to run, and then it might take a day or two to analyze that data and figure out what it means. How many, how many day, day or two day cycles do we have? We need, we need to narrow it down to a degree. So uh, that's what the frequencies, that's the importance of the frequencies uh, is for risk and load mostly. Well, I'm not uh, running off quickly. Um, now that I'm done speaking, I'm allowed to eat. So uh, I'm happy to continue taking questions. I have no idea how long that was. I don't see a clock anywhere. But um, thank, you for, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to see me. Thank you.